In the opening chapters of his book, Punishing the Poor, Professor Louis Wacant argues that in the United States, social welfare programs have largely been dismantled, while at the same time, incarceration rates have skyrocketed. He attributes this to the neoliberal government, which is prevalent in the United States. Neoliberalism refers to economic deregulation and is a market-driven approach to economic and social policy, which stresses the efficiency of private enterprise and seeks to transfer control of the economy from the public to the private sector. Wakant argues that the neoliberalism movement in America has marginalized workers. Today, there has been a noticeable drop in real wages, a shortening in job tenures, a reduction in workers' rights, and a surge in precarious wage work. There are also fewer full-time jobs as these have been replaced by the expansion of contingent forms of employment. So while job security and decent wages were once readily available, especially during the days of automobile giant Henry Ford, these manufacturing positions are becoming extinct. Today, all throughout the United States, specialized temp agencies have increased, and more and more people are settling for part-time work. One in three Americans in the labor force is a non-standard wage earner, and this has generated an enormous sense of social insecurity among Americans. So the neoliberal government with its laissez-faire economic policies has led to an enormous sense of anxiety, fear, and social and mental insecurity. According to Wakant, the erosion of stable wage work has had ravaging effects on the lower class and has caused some individuals to fall through the cracks and be left behind. While Kant argues that in the neoliberal age, unemployed youths, beggars, illegal immigrants, drug addicts, and the homeless, among other groups, are a living incarnation of the generalized social insecurity. Wakan insinuates that the criminal justice system has been used as a tool to force these groups to conform to an unstable job market of temporary, part-time, and low-paid, flexible employment. As a result of this, incarceration rates have skyrocketed. In, the 19, uh, in 1970, there were 200,000 individuals in prison. By 1995, there would be nearly 1 million individuals in prison. This represents a 442% increase, which is astounding. According to the U.S. Department of Justice Statistics, in 2009, which is the same year that Wakant published his book, 2.3 million adults were incarcerated in U.S. federal and state prisons and county jails. This is about 1% of adults in the U.S. resident population. So this indicates that the amount of incarcerated people has increased more than tenfold between 1970 and the present. Also keep in mind that this figure does not even consider the fact that almost 5 million adults in 2009 were on probation or parole. So we are talking about a total of almost 7.3 million adults who are under correctional supervision in 2009. Wakana attributes this punishment binge to the neoliberal government and he asserts that the penal system has been unleashed against the urban poor, particularly against young African-American males. Wakant contends that these young men are the new urban proletariat. One in six African-American men is doing or has done hard time. They are marginalized by governmental policies which deregulate the economy, thereby resulting in less legitimate employment opportunities. At the same time, however, Wakant argues that governmental policies have strengthened and expanded the penal system. Incarceration and 
aggressive policing tactics have been deployed against these groups beginning in the late 1970s and later in 1983 with the war on drugs. Interestingly, in the U.S., both political parties have advocated ultra-repressive law enforcement policies. Wakant argues that President Bill Clinton embraced law and order tactics which helped land him to, in the White House. And nations all throughout the world, particularly those countries which are the most advanced, are beginning to emulate the United States' war on crime experiment by hardening their criminal justice policies. Wakant argues that Britain, as well as other Western European nations, have, fallen, have followed the United States model. Professor Wakant is originally from France, and he contends that it too has thrown itself into the law and order trap. So, the push toward punishment is something that is happening on both sides of the Atlantic, though still much more so in the United States. And Latin American countries have also begun to follow this path of liberating the economy while enhancing punitive criminal justice policies. And according to Wakant, this is beginning to happen worldwide in spite of overwhelming evidence that mass incarceration, at least in the United States, has been extremely costly, inefficient, and to a large degree inhumane. One of the major themes of this book is that in the neoliberal era, the penal state is replacing the welfare state. In fact, Wakan asserts that people who receive governmental assistance, as well as those who go to prison, are both considered to be morally deficient, and their behaviors are constantly supervised and regulated. He believes that this is directly related to the economic deregulation and refers to the United States as a liberal, paternalistic, political regime. By this, Wakant is referring to the fact that the government takes a laissez-faire, hands-off approach with the individuals who are in the top of the class structure. However, at the same time, it takes a punitive and paternalistic approach to those who are at the bottom of the class structure. The state tries to control these individuals at the bottom of the class structure and has to a large degree substituted welfare with what Wakant refers to as prison fare. The police, the courts, and custodial institutions have been deployed aggressively against this latter group. Make no mistake that Wakant perceives social welfare as it is currently administered in the United States to be very repressive. He sees both welfare and prison fare attempts to supervise the poor in the post-civil rights era of deregulated, low-wage work. Of course, it is very important to remember that welfare in the United States is very underdeveloped compared to its European counterparts. And since the 1970s, the limited social welfare programs that did exist have been disappearing. And according to Wakant, in the neoliberal era, welfare has been largely replaced by prison fare, which is considered more expensive in terms of both dollars and cents in civil liberties. Wakant argues that, ironically, the U.S. government provides much more support to corporations and the wealthy than it does to the poor. And he contends that the social welfare programs were scaled back beginning in the early 1970s as part of a backlash against the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Racial minorities were able to achieve huge victories during the 1960s, and Wakant insinuates that a conservative movement took hold during the next decade and it essentially deprived racial minorities, among other groups, of victories that they had achieved. This was done by dismantling the welfare state and assembling what would become a large-scale mass incarceration movement directed against the poor. Today, one child in four and one black child in two lives under the official poverty line. And the social welfare program aid to families with dependent children never reached so much as 1% of the federal budget. Nevertheless, every administration in the United States since Jimmy Carter 
has insisted on reducing AFDC. This carried President Reagan and Clinton to the White House. In the era of neoliberalism, the United States has decreased its commitment to the social support of the poor, while at the same time accelerating its commitment to criminal justice expenditures. Even when a family is entitled to welfare benefits, there are enormous bureaucratic obstacles which just discourage them from receiving the meager assistance to which they are legally entitled. Multiple forms must be filled out, and states have made access to public aid conditional, conditional upon holding certain behavioral norms and upon performing humiliating bureaucratic obligations. For example, in New Jersey during the mid-1990s, AFDC benefits were terminated in, if an unmarried teen mother did not reside with her parents. Also, anyone who receives welfare must agree to accept any job, whatever the pay and working conditions are, or they lose their right to public assistance. And welfare recipients are often dressed up as workers, meaning they often have to attend pseudo-training programs that offer few, if any, skills or job prospects. And typically, no money is given for child care assistance. So if a welfare recipient may actually be, uh, be forced to find someone to watch over their children while they appear to look as though they are busy working. Well, Kant contends that current recipients of social welfare are closely supervised enforced to comply with behavioral rules by means of fines, reductions of benefits, or termination of benefits, irrespective of their levels of need. According to Wakant, the war on drugs, which officially began in 1983, was little more than a form of penal harassment against low-level street dealers and poor consumers. As he contends, Authorities had no reason during this time to declare a war on drugs in the first place, since it was well known amongst public officials and drug policy scholars that both marijuana and cocaine use had been steadily declining since 1977. Wakant seems to insinuate that policymakers knew that the war on drugs would disproportionately impact lower class African Americans and this was a way to undermine victories won by African-American men after the Civil Rights Revolution. Also, the massive incarceration movement in America has occurred at a time when the, when the crime rate was stagnant and then actually declining. So even in spite of a dropping crime rate, more and more people, usually poor minority men, were becoming ensnared in the criminal justice system. Well, Kant argues that incarceration has been utilized in America during the last 30 years as a tool to warehouse individuals who are by and large rejects of the market economy.